Graphene is a unique nanoscale form of carbon that is disrupting legacy materials, bringing step change improvements in performance across a wide range of industrial and consumer applications. From energy storage and electronics to everyday materials, graphene enables products that are better, stronger and lighter, while increasing durability and improving sustainability. Graphene is leading the era of new advanced materials. The following is a presentation that was given as part of a two-day virtual Graphene Investors Conference hosted by the Graphene Council. For those of you who are not familiar with the Graphene Council, we are the leading graphene-related trade and professional body. We reach more than 35,000 materials professionals, the majority of which are in end-user applications. These would be large industrial companies, petrochemical, plastics, automotive, aerospace, construction, and other advanced materials related um, activities. We have a very qualified team of individuals, uh, including Dexter Johnson and a senior analyst with us based in Europe, Shirag Ratwani based in the UK, is a graph, is a advanced material scientist, John Baker in the US for health and safety, Trevor Keel in the UK as well, is an advanced material expert, and Keyshawn Tokar out of Switzerland, um, an alumni of ETH in Zurich, is on our team as well. And in addition to that, we have a back office in India, which works with us on patents and other related information. Graphing Council provides an extensive suite of services. We are first and foremost a membership organization, and so we work and advocate on behalf of our members, which include producers of graphene as well as users of graphene equally. We serve the entire ecosystem, as well as the academic community that is working on research and development of applications for graphene and other related advanced materials, including things like Maxines, TMDCs, HBN, and other 2D advanced materials. We provide material testing and characterization services uh, through our volunteer group, a large volunteer group. We've actually written standards for graphene, the graphene classification framework, which we have then licensed to ISO, and which is currently being converted into an official international standard. We also conduct due diligence on companies. So if there's an investment opportunity and you want to understand the technology of that company or have an opinion about their application development pipeline, et cetera, we can do technical due diligence. We also provide uh, bespoke advisory services and many, many other support services to advance this sector. Now, graphene has existed before the 2004 uh, milestone, which is uh, viewed as the, the, the origin of graphene. There are actually papers from prior to that period. But 2004 is what we accept as the start of graphene when it was first isolated as an individual 2D material at the University of Manchester. The two scientists that made that uh, discovery and wrote the paper about it were later awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010, which kicked off an enormous um, hive of activity related to graphene with uh, now, as, as we said, from 2004 to today, more than 150,000 patents have been written related to graphene. Tens of thousands of uh, research papers are, um, are written about graphene every year. And so we had this tremendous interest in graphene. And you'll understand why in a moment. I, I assume many people here are already familiar with graphene, but there are some very specific reasons why this material has attracted such high attention. Now, for a new material to go from just being discovered to be commercially exploited does not happen in a matter of just four, five, six, or even 10 years. It takes longer than that. And so there was a period of disappointment that graphene didn't immediately become a worldwide sensational success commercially. We now find ourselves in 2024, where the industry has matured tremendously on the production side, the ability to produce graphene at mass scale and at an affordable price. And at the same time, end users have become, become uh, more familiar with the material and have understood how to exploit it and use it in different applications. And we'll talk about that just now. 
The properties of graphene are why it's attracted so much attention. And you see them here. You have you know, a dozen significant positive aspects of uh, graphene as an inherent, inherent in the material. So the thermal conductivity, the strength, the electrical conductivity, the ability for it to resist uh, UV rays, to make other materials uh, less flammable. All of these attributes are quite positive and can be used across an extremely broad range of applications. In one case, it might be used simply for its strength aspect, such as when it's added to concrete. In another, it might be used for thermal management as a heat spreader in electronics, et cetera, et cetera. And the interesting thing with graphene is that it differs from other materials when typically you're adding, let's say a material like carbon black as a filler you often have a corresponding sacrifice that you have to make in performance to get a positive aspect out of a material. With graphene, it is almost never the case where we've seen that there is a trade-off on the negative side. In fact, what normally happens is when graphene is added, say for strength, there is a happy second benefit to it, such as makes a plastic material less flammable or it makes it more thermally conductive. So this is why graphene has attracted such tremendous attention at the beginning of this story. And this is why graphene will continue to attract attention and why it will be a successful commercial material because it imparts so many positive attributes to other materials that it is used with, or it enables things such as sensors that are faster, lighter, less, um, less energy demand, uh, more accurate, et cetera, that existing technology just cannot match. And so when we look at the array of applications where graphene has real uh, real bite and, and relevance, uh, we identify more than 45 distinct vertical applications where graphene can be applied. There's actually more than this. There are hundreds of applications where graphene can make a difference. And we are now at the stage here, 20 years since the isolation of graphene in 2004, where we know this material works, it is being produced at commercial scale, and it is being adopted by industry. So it's a really interesting time for us to look at this material. I also want to impart that graphene is not a single material. If you look at the scientific definition, it is a single atomic layer of sp2 bonded carbon, so a, a single atom which is why it's called a two-dimensional material, that it's all surface area. But in fact, graphene includes materials that might be two, three, four, five, up to 10 carbon layers, graphene nanoplatelets, graphene oxide, which is a graphene that has between 30 and 40% oxygen content in it, a reduced graphene oxide, or you could have functionalized material where other elements or chemicals have been added to the graphene either on the surface or on the edges where it is decorated, and that gives it some additional properties. What this means is that graphene is really a family of materials, and it's important to understand that different forms of graphene are suitable for different applications. So that's, uh, that's something not to, not to be forgotten in this story. When we look at the graphene value chain, I like to look at it from this perspective, that you have folks that are playing in the raw material sector and raw materials for graphene traditionally have been graphite, but they also include biomass materials that could be waste product from the forestry industry, for example, or from agriculture. You also have carbon bearing gases like methane or acetylene that can be used to produce graphene. The point is there are more than a dozen qualified source materials, raw materials to make graphene, and these are all in abundance. Then you look at the production methodology and there's another dozen ways of making graphene. You can have physical exfoliation, electrochemical processes, uh, uh, um, pyrolysis, so applying heat to convert carbon material into graphene. Again, there's, there's 12 different ways you can apply a plasma field, et cetera. So graphene producers will adopt different production methods, and some graphene producers employ more than one method for actually producing graphene. And then you look what happens to the material after the raw graphene has been produced. And there are different ways of manipulating this material that could be to functionalize or enhance its properties. It could be to make master batch formulations. 
So for example, if I want to put graphene into a polypropylene uh, material, I can either as a plastics manufacturer purchase graphene and do that myself, or you might have a formulator or a compounder who has made a batch of polypropylene with graphene already added in it. So that's in the uh, post-production processing. And then of course we have <clears throat> brands that would be you know large automobile companies, aerospace companies, uh, sports sports equipment, et cetera, that are actually using the graphene and they're enhancing their products uh, by by using graphene into their uh, supply chains. Um, who are also part of this conversation and who need to understand what type of graphene at what load factor can be used to get the kind of properties they want for competitive advantage or to make a material more sustainable or to make it more recyclable. In this ecosystem, we have companies that adopt a vertical integration strategy. Uh, one company, for example, owns a graphite source. They make graphene out of it and then they turn it into a battery anode material. You have other companies that adopt the strategy of focusing just on the post-production processing of functionalization or making formulations. And so that's another aspect to consider that is relevant for investors to look at what is the strategy of the company in terms of vertical integration or not. Then I also want to point out that the Graphene Council operates the only in-person graphene verification program where we inspect companies and products. So we will actually go on site to a graphene production facility, evaluate their quality control processes. We'll take a sample of the material and have it fully characterized. And then we also evaluate the company's ability to scale and we verify the production capacity claims that they make. There are six companies that have gone through this process in the past year that you see here. These are all verified by the Graphene Council with an in-person inspection and a thorough interrogation of the materials that they produce. I wanna also point out that on the health and safety side, there's been a lot of progress made and recently was the first inhuman, uh, first human, <laughs> not inhuman, was the first human inhalation study of a graphene oxide material that showed that the graphene oxide did not produce an adverse reaction in humans after several trials of high volume inhalation of this material. Now, the meat of all this is looking at what is the production and forca demand forecast for a graphene material. Today, there's approximately 25,000 metric tons of graphene production, and that does not include any claims of production out of China. We want to state that it is very difficult and uh, it's an opaque market to actually verify what comes out of China. Quite a lot of material that we have tested that has come out of China is not graphene according to the ISO definition. And therefore we do not include any of this in our production capacity uh, analysis. On the demand side, there are a number of extremely high volume markets uh, with potential for graphene. So here we have concrete, lubricating oils, different polymers, PET, polypropylene, polyethylene, et cetera. Where graphene, we know that it works. And the interesting thing with graphene is it can be added at a very low ratio, in this case, 0 0.001 or 0 0.005, that results in thousands of tons of graphene, hundreds of thousands of tons of graphene in the end that will be needed to address these markets. If you would like detailed information about the graphene sector, we have an extensive graphene report. This is over 800 pages across three volumes that covers production, characterization, et cetera. So I hope it's obvious to anybody who's watching all of these presentations that graphene has matured from a nascent, newly discovered material 20 years ago to a fully commercialized, mature product today, and that this is quite an investable sector You've seen companies here who are bringing this product to market, generating revenues today, have interesting business models, uh, whether they be licensing or product development or vertical integration, there's a million different ways to attack this. The Graphene Council is a independent uh, source of information on this. We collect data, we monitor the market, we set standards, we test the materials, we verify companies. Uh, we do everything we can to help support the sector in an independent, uh, fact-based way.
So for those in the investment community who are interested in these individual companies, please reach out to them directly. If you're interested in more macro vision and information about the market, we're the ones you can contact and we will help you navigate this. For more information on market opportunities and to connect with experts, contact the Graphene Council at thegrapheneCouncil.org.